Ghana has enjoyed two decades of steady growth, but the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the Ukraine-Russia crisis could dent economic prospects. With one of the largest economies in West Africa, the gold, cocoa, and oil producer has until now refused to seek international monetary fund support to rescue an economy that is facing the headwinds of the pandemic, rising inflation, and a depreciating currency. On July 1st, it was announced that Ghana's cabinet had approved the start of formal negotiations with the IMF on a support package. The decision comes after a phone conversation between President Nana Akofuado and the IMF's managing director. The new decade, whose beginning has been marked by the COVID-19 pandemic and the Ukraine-Russia crisis, is testing Ghana's resilience and the, inclusive, in the inclusivity with which the country pursues economic and social development. Now joining me is Dr. Josh Baumfold. He's a partner in Head Transfer Pricing and Economic Advisory Services for Anderson, Nigeria. Dr. Josh Baumfold, welcome again to Business Edge. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Tony, for having me. So let's look at this. In terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, Ghana was one of those economies that stood out. We had that conversation as to how well Ghana seemingly had done during the pandemic. And then alarm bells started ringing, and Finance Minister Ken Oforiata said that in May, Ghana would solve its debt crisis without any help from the IMF. And then July 1st, we hear news of the cabinets approving the start of conversations. What do you think has pushed Ghana to the IMF now? I think there are multiplicity of factors, you know, some being remote, others being immediate. Mm. I think the most immediate um, concern had to be with the fact that there was some over-reliance on the ability to generate additional tax revenue, you know, at home. And that led to the introduction of the unpopular e-levy tax on financial transactions, especially when it comes to payment and transfer of funds. Um, the, there was a, a target or a budget, you know, that they expected to generate from that particular source of tax revenue mobilization. Unfortunately, there was a politicization of that particular policy that led to it becoming extremely unpopular and more people deciding not to make use of such platforms in order to make payments, which meant that the actual revenue generated from year levy fell significantly short of what they had budgeted for, which meant that they really had significant fund um, revenue um, challenges. And that precipitated the need to have a conversation with, you know, the IMF. That might be the immediate issue, but there are other remote issues. Even prior to, you know, the pandemic period, we had some debt challenges. And that was the reason why in 2015, under the previous government, John Mahama government, we went to the IMF. There was a clear recognition that our debt situation, you know, wasn't sustainable. Hence, we needed IMF intervention. Over the course of that period, what we need to realize is this. As of 2011, our debt to GDP ratio was around 31%. In 2006, we had been given some kind of IMF debt relief. So our debt to GDP ratio was around 26%. Between 2011 and 2016, which is the final year of the John Mahama's government, the debt to GDP ratio had ballooned to almost 55%, adding some 20% to it. So under the current government, between 2017 to 2019, they were able to manage the debt to GDP ratio between about 56% to about 62%. However, in 2020, we had the pandemic, mm. all right, which necessitated the need to save lives and livelihoods. Hence, there was significant increase in expenditures way above what they had budgeted for. And because the economy also slowed down, all right, the debt to GDP ratio ballooned to almost 79%. By 2021, it was around 80%. That is clearly unsustainable levels. So there was the expectation that they might go to the IMF at that point. However, they thought they could generate more revenue inward. What really hurt the whole situation was when the independent um, credit rating agencies decided to downgrade the, yeah, the sovereign credit rating of Ghana, which meant that it was much more difficult to borrow from the private international community that they used to rely on whenever there were some shortages. So now, even though they could still borrow, it was going to cause them high interest rates. So you then have to consider concessional loans from you know, international financial institutions such as IMF. However, the problem is the fact that they usually come up and come up with conditionalities that can be anti-growth because you really need to rein in your expenditures 
and be able to mobilize more revenues when you go to such financial institutions. So and I, sometimes I, I, expenditures okay, okay. on capital just to be hurt. So I want us to get into that because there are a lot of people who are concerned about what the IMF may demand from Ghana. But before that, let's get to some of these debt challenges. So you've talked about, of course, how much Ghana owes. And let's quickly look at that because right now, a large part of Ghana's debt is owed to private lenders. And the IMF says about 57% of Ghana's external debt payments go to private lenders like international investment banks, hedge funds, and asset managers rather than multilateral institutions such as the World Bank or the IMF. Is that an issue that this large majority of debt is in the hands of private lenders, which might make it more difficult for Ghana to do what it needs to do? So there are two ways of looking at it. There's a reason why we have a significant chunk of it coming from the private investment community. Because when you go to a private investment community, you don't have to, you, you are not tied down with conditionalities that can actually restrain your ability to embark on growth policies such as your industrialization program and all that. So that's the reason why they tend to go to the private investment community as opposed to going to international financial institutions such as the IMF. Now, the IMF should always be seen more like a lender of last resort, right? Um, I always, um, the analogy I give is the emergency room. You, when you get a headache, you don't rush to go to the emergency room. That would be problematic. You only get to the emergency room when you really have severe cases that you cannot actually address with your normal uh, uh, medical doctor. So clearly, there's always a reluctance to go to IMF. So your first option would be to go to the private um, you know, investment community. That said, when you have very significant uh, potential debt distress, then it becomes a challenge because the IMF, even if some of these international financial institutions went, want to engage in terms of debt restructuring or extreme case debt forgiveness, they cannot force the private you know, sectors to do the same. And that is one of the challenge of you know, um, them being able to help us. So each of these options have its pros and cons. You go to a private um, investment community so that you don't have your hands tied, so that you can continue to embark on your growth policies. However, if you're not able to resolve your debt distress situation and you go to the IMF, you're going to come with conditionalities which can lead to some austerity period where you know, um, some social intervention policies have to be given up, mm. and even some of the capital projects that are needed for economic growth might have to be curtailed. So that is basically the pros and cons of each option. But now um, Canada doesn't have a choice but to actually go to the IMF and deal with the conditionality issues. So a further look at this debt also looks at the balance of payments, uh, and some have termed this a crisis now for Ghana. Um, Central Bank Governor Ernest Addison in May said that Ghana faced an overall balance of payments deficit of around $934.5 million in the first quarter of 2022, compared with $429.9 million from the same period last year. So how did the balance of payment situation for Ghana now become a crisis situation? So I think they are all interrelated, right? When you talk about balance of payments, you're looking at the fact that our import demand in the form of import of the products, services, and capital far outstrip our export supply of the same you know, um, items I just mentioned. So when that is the case, you only can import when you have forex. So if your import far exceeds your export, which actually ends you forex, then there's some significant pressure on the forex market in terms of you know shortage in forex in that particular market and the central bank um, the central bank of ghana which is the BOG bank of ghana has the responsibility of making sure that we don't have a free fall a falling of the ghana city against hard currencies such as the usd now at the same time our international you know external reserves are significantly depleting and sometimes in the short in the short period what you then tend to rely on is sometimes borrow from the international market, get some USD, inject it into the market to stabilize the foreign exchange rate, at least in the short term. But in the medium to long term, the only way you can deal with such um, balance of payment you know, challenges when there's a huge deficit is to restructure the economy to be more export oriented. Now, we have an opportunity to do that. Ghana has a clear policy on industrialization to become the industrial hub for West Africa. There's the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement that allows businesses that come to establish in Ghana to access the larger African market. You know, however, from the word go, Ghana had had a challenge in terms of its debt situation. Mm. And so the whole process of restructuring this economy to become export-oriented needs some time. 
And in between now and that time, you need to be able to sometimes get some injection of additional USD in the form of borrowing from the international market, which now has become more difficult because of the downgrading of the credit rating. So all these issues are interrelated. And once you have part of the cards falling, you see that the other parts also start falling. So you have a debt crisis that is clearly related to a foreign exchange challenge. You know, that's clearly related to, you know, us not being able to generate enough revenue locally and all that. So all these are interrelated and there's a need to stop the bleeding. And it looks like, at least for now, going to the IMF, IMF injecting some, you know, um, USD funds and also giving us some credibility because IMF will make sure that we um, embark on a fiscal consolidation process where we don't overspend way more than what we can actually raise. And that okay. credibility hopefully will let us be able to start borrowing again in the short term, 10 things around. Then we get back to how we were performing prior to the COVID-19 pandemic where we're going at the high um, economic growth rate. All right, Dr. Bang, for hold the line. When we come back, we'll look at a simple question. Do you think Ghana is in debt distress right now or in risk of a debt default? And then we'll also look at the currency. The CD has struggled and lost about 20% of its value against the dollar in just this year. We'll get into those issues. And of course, what Ghana can expect from the IMF as Ghana extends a hand, says we are open to negotiations to help us through these troubled times. The conversation continues right after this. My guest is Dr. Josh Bamfo, partner and head transfer pricing and economic advisory services for Anderson, Nigeria. As we look at Ghana now opening itself up to negotiations with the International Monetary Fund. Now, in 2021, Ghana was identified as one of 72 debt vulnerable countries. Zambia defaulted in 2020, and the World Bank says more than half of all low income countries are currently at high risk of debt distress or are already in debt distress. Sri Lanka has defaulted on its debts in May, and Pakistan is struggling to avoid a similar predicament. Dr. Bamfo, the question now is, is Ghana presently in debt distress by your estimation, or do you think we're looking at a high risk of debt default? So I would agree that Ghana faces some debt distress now, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, facing the possibility of defaulting on their debt. Those are two different issues. So they are debt distressed because really we find ourselves in a debt trap. The truth of the matter is if you look at our budget, right, we still have about 40 something percent of you know, our expenditures going to financing existing debt. All right. And that is in itself problematic, which means that we are left with just little to actually embark on capital projects that is supposed to spare economic growth and create job opportunities for the masses. So you then end up with a deficit, which you need to finance by borrowing. You know, so you tend to find yourself in some kind of debt trap where you are moving in this, uh, in this cycle. So there's an importance for us to really look how best we go about dealing with this issue. And unfortunately, given that we cannot actually generate the amount of revenue at this point, even though the digitalization program that the current government has embarked on will enable them to broaden the, the tax net and bringing individuals and businesses that hitherto weren't being captured by the system in order to pay their fair amount of taxes. But this will take a bit of time. So clearly, with us going to the IMF, and the IMF hopefully um, negotiating with, um, with the government to something that is reasonable and fair, the injection of new funds will be helpful. Um, assuming that you know the government is successful in negotiating terms, that does not stop them from embarking on the capital projects that are needed for growth and that would be very helpful. And that will also give the investment community some confidence, you know, knowing that Ghana can actually pay its debt and therefore be able to lend to them at reasonable rates. And that will help the economy actually get out of this trap and, you know, go back to the path of high economic growth. We need to recognize that Ghana was one of the fastest growing economies prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were about four countries that were growing at a very high rate. Unfortunately, we always had a debt challenge. And the um, pandemic basically worsened it. And that's the reason why we're going through this period of um, you know, lack of stabilization. So once we stabilize this, um, this economy um, by dealing with the debt issues and the forex issues, I believe that Ghana can get back on track. So they shouldn't be con too concerned about the, um, the um, potential for default. Okay. But clearly, Ghana is on debt distress.
like many of us across the continent. Let's quickly look exactly. at the CD now. Um, this, by June, the CD had dropped by 22% against the dollar this year, making it the worst performing currency in Africa after Zimbabwe's dollar. And a lot of people, when I read that, I was it was incredulous to me that the CD was only second to the Zim dollar. So many believe that it's far from over, the hardships that are being experienced tied to the CD. And of course, as you said, a lot of these issues are interlinked. But do you think it can get worse? What exactly is the issue with the CD right now? So when it comes to CD, there's a demand and supply issue, just like any market, the foreign exchange market. So when we talked about balance of payment crisis, we saw that import demand is way higher than export supply. And that is basically it. So if more and more people and businesses are demanding more forex, all right, in order to import goods, services, and capital, all right, then there's going to be significant pressure on the city. And that's what leads to the city being depreciated. So at the time that export is falling short significantly to the import, and you can't also borrow in, um, from the international market to inject some dollars in the short term, you realize that your international um, you know, reserves, in terms of external reserves, um, depletes, and that leads to a further um, depreciation of the city. So I believe that you know, going to the IMF, in part, because definitely any injection of funds is going to be in USD, in the short term, will help stabilize the city a bit whilst we continue to restructure the economy to make it more export oriented. Because injecting um, dollars through borrowing can never be a sustainable solution. Mm. All right, the sustainable solution is restructuring the economy to make it more export oriented, making sure that raw materials are converted into processed finished products and sold intra-Africa through the AFCA um, um, policy as well as outside of Africa. That is the only way we can have a sustainable, strong city against the hard currencies. But in the short term, we need Forex, all right? And going to the IMF will help, at least in the short term. But it doesn't solve the problem in the long term. So we need to continue to restructure the economy and make it more export-oriented. So let's look at what to expect from the IMF. Now, an IMF spokesperson said that the multilateral lender stands ready to assist Ghana to restore macroeconomic stability, safeguard debt sustainability, promote uh, inclusive and sustainable growth, and also address the impact of the war in Russia and Ukraine and the lingering pandemic. And analysts are torn. They're torn between whether or not Ghana may have to restructure its debt along the G20 uh, common framework process. And some have described that process as pro, uh, protracted very difficult and even ineffective. So what do you think the IMF is going to demand and do we see restructuring in Ghana's future? So I think there are two separate issues. So going to the IMF, you know, um, I believe the IMF has shown indication of working with Ghana to resolve their issues. Um, IMF expected this from a significant number of developing and middle income countries. That is the lingering effect of um, COVID-19. And so this is not coming as any surprise to IMF. They've been monitoring the situation for a while. So I think the engagement with IMF is not going to be preconditioned with us going to the G20 common and framework to restructure our debt or get in some debt relief. I think that will be a separate conversation. But on the IMF issue, I think what is going to be extremely important is how Ghana goes in and negotiates for an outcome that is win-win for both parties. Because IMF, as a lender of last resort, will make sure that Ghana actually spends where it has to spend and, you know, cut down on what they would define as waste and still mobilize more revenue in order to make them sustainable when it comes to its debt management. So that's going to be the focus on, of IMF. Now, it's going to be up to our leaders to ensure that throughout the negotiation process, we don't lose out on our ability to continue to invest in capital projects that are necessary to continue to create Ghana as an investment hub so that we can have more job opportunities for the team in masses. We cannot go through a period of austerity where we don't make those necessary investments or else the economy is not going to grow. So how we go and negotiate and the outcome of that negotiation is going to be critical. On the G20 um, common um, framework um, side, I think it's something that we need to look at. It's not been too successful. I know that um, Zambia has been part of it, Ethiopia and Chad. You know, but we still need to look at the possibility of restructuring some of these debt to longer-term debt so that our payments of those debts are pushed into the future, some of those into the future. And where we can get debt relief from some of um, these G20 countries, that would be great. But as you rightly said, 57% of our debt, external debt, is actually from the private sector. Yes. And the challenge with this framework has been 
how do you get the private sector to also to restructure your, the debt to um, some of these developing countries, let alone give them debt relief? So that is the reason why the framework has not been that effective so far, but it's something that you have to look into. All right, Dr. Josh Bamford, we'll end the conversation here for today, but many of us will have our eyes on Ghana and the negotiations with the IMF to see how things play out. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Tony. All right, Appreciate have a good it. one. And these talks are coming just about three years after Ghana exited an IMF program. In April 2015, the country turned to the IMF for a $918 million loan to support its ailing currency and help stabilize the economy. IMF advisors working with the government developed a three-part program to restore debt sustainability, strengthen monetary policy, and clean up the banking system. But no one could have predicted the COVID-19 pandemic nor predict the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which seems to have rolled back the gains that Ghana made at that time. We'll be watching to see how things play out because, of course, it's not just Ghana that is an African nation in a debt trap. Leka Onobanjo is standing by right now with International Business News, and that's coming up right here on Business Edge.